there! I'm Lana Smith with the Leslie Science and Nature Center and the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum. Today, we are going to discover the world of plants, but not just anything about plants. Today, we're going to look at the anatomy of plants. Now, mostly when we talk about living things, we focus a lot on animals, their adaptations, where they live, or how we humans can actually relate to certain creatures. But Plants play just as vital of a role when it comes to the survival of certain habitats or the survival of other organisms, including us. And there's a lot of mechanisms and functions that happen in just one plant that can be beneficial not only for the plant's growth and survival, but for other animals and plant survival too, different relationships that they have and more. However, it's important to note what we see and why we see it and how the functions or features that we see on certain plants help them survive and grow. The six parts of a plant that we are going to discover are as follows. The stems, the leaves, the flowers, the fruit, the seeds, and the roots. We usually call these six things external parts or things that we can physically see just by looking at a plant. There are other important internal parts, what's happening inside some of these structures that also help a plant function, but for today, we'll just look at what we find out on the outside. The anatomy of a plant also gives us an inside look into how these plants function in their habitats and ecosystems. Not all plants we find will have these six features, but most of them need the anatomy that we see just to fulfill their basic needs for survival and growth. To help us take a closer look at these six main parts, let's go ahead and see if we can find a plant that has all six features and take a better look at how they work to help these plants survive. To figure out how all these six main parts work when it comes to a plant's anatomy, I'm kind of going to use a combination of full plants and then parts of plants that we humans are familiar with because we can eat them. We can actually eat all six main parts of a plant depending on the plant that you find. The first part that we're going to discover today is typically underground, but is usually one we often learn when it comes to plants. The plant I'm going to use to help with us today is what we call garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is considered an invasive species, meaning that it actually overtakes areas where native plants should be able to grow. So pulling garlic mustard, as long as you pull it in an appropriate time of the season and make sure you get the whole plant out of the ground, can actually be beneficial to native plants within your habitat. And it gives you a really cool inside look to some of these main parts that we're going to discuss today. The first part I want to show you is right here along the bottom, the plant's roots. Now a plant's roots are pretty popular because we know that a plant not only needs its roots to help hold the plant in place, but this is the primary place where a plant absorbs nutrients. Throughout the different parts of a root, there are root hairs at the end of each root. That's where it's able to soak up essential nutrients that the plant can then carry throughout the rest of its body. Now for roots, some of the nutrients that they collect besides water, can include things like nitrogen, phosphorus, even certain metals like magnesium that's found within the soils. This is often why with certain fertilizers, you'll hear that they'll contain a large amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. Those are main essential nutrients that are required in order for a plant to complete their life cycle. Now another famous root that you're probably all familiar with looks a lot like this. Many of these parts that we find in plants can be edible, and one of the big root plants that we know of is a potato. Sometimes you can also think of an onion, too. You can even see some sprouts coming out of this potato. This is where a lot of the nutrients are held or absorbed within a potato plant, which is also why it's really good for humans to eat, because then we can get those nutrients, too, that we need to survive and grow. As we work our way up the plant to the next main structure, then we can focus on what's coming out of the root these long stalks we see in the plant. That's the plant's stem. And a stem is responsible for not only helping to hold a plant upright, but to also transport water and other nutrients to different areas of the plants. Think of it like a pipe or a straw, especially for soaking up water and these other nutrients, bringing it into their leaves and some other main parts near the top. The next part we'll focus on is that of leaves. 
Now, if you've ever seen leaves falling off of a tree, or in the springtime, as leaves begin to grow out of buds and sprouts, leaves play an essential part in a process we call photosynthesis. They basically act like solar panels to a plant. When photosynthesis occurs, it always happens within a leaf. What's happening is that sunlight is being directed onto the leaf. And therefore, this leaf uses something called chlorophyll, or kind of looks like a green pigment, that traps energy from the sun. Then, using the sunlight's energy, combined with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and water that is transported through the stem, it converts those materials, using the sun's energy, into sugars, or glucose. And then it also releases oxygen into the air. This reaction is not only vital in order for this plant to gain energy in the form of sugars, but also vital for many living things that require oxygen to breathe, to survive, to have oxygen in our atmosphere. So that order or that function of photosynthesis is vital for all life forms, plants, animals, and others included. Then, as we work our way up near the top of the plant, you're going to see the garlic mustard's flowers. We know flowers can come in all different shapes, sizes, colors, or smells. We humans usually use flowers for decorations. But plants use flowers to help attract pollinators or to help this plant become pollinated by certain organisms. Oftentimes, the color, shape, size, or smell of a flower depends on what kind of organism pollinates this plant by drinking nectar and gathering pollen from inside the flower and then transporting it to a new individual to help these plants reproduce and continue their life cycle. We humans, while we use flowers for decorations, we often also attract pollinators based on the flowers or plants that we grow. And some plants will have their flowers bloom based on when their pollinators are most often around. For example, we sometimes find plants that only bloom during certain times of the year, sometimes even only for a day or two. Other times, we'll find flowers that only bloom at night. Why? Well, that's because their pollinators are nocturnal, meaning they're primarily looking for nectar only at night. One kind of flower that we're very familiar with with eating is that of broccoli or broccoli floret. While it might not look like most kinds of flowers we find or choose to plant in our gardens, this is actually considered the flower of a broccoli plant that comes from the ground. If you look close, you can actually see the different structures of a flower just by looking inside the top of a piece of broccoli. The next part of a plant, or the fifth part we're discovering, is that of a seed. A seed is basically a protective covering for baby plants, either keeping a plant dormant if there's not enough nutrients in the soil for it to grow, or having certain functions to protect other parts of the seed, the inside, from getting eaten by animals, getting damaged by weather, or to be carried and dispersed farther away to give the opportunity for a plant's life cycle to continue. Sometimes seeds come in different shapes and sizes too, but that's because of how they're dispersed. A common type of seed that we see during this time of year are those from dandelions. Now, dandelion seeds act like mini parachutes. What happens is that these seeds end up being dispersed by wind, not so much by pollinators. And what happens is as the wind carries these seeds like little parachutes, they're able to migrate or travel or their farther distances along a lawn or a prairie and then can be buried into the soil there, allowing dandelions as a whole for their life cycle to continue and ensuring that this individual dandelion's life cycle and traits are passed down through the seeds to other dandelion generations. Other seeds that we're familiar with, ones that we might eat or that we often see if we're planting something like a garden, are that of sunflowers. And some seeds will have a really thick seed coat depending on how they need to protect the inside of the seed, basically the baby plant. Sometimes they'll have a thicker coating, sometimes they'll have one that's more round, they'll have hair, sometimes spikes, but those mechanisms are important to protect the inner side of that seed. The seed itself has its own parts or anatomy too that can help us understand just how baby plants are able to grow thanks to the nutrients they find already stored in the seed and the ones that they're looking for in the soil. And then the last part or the sixth part we focus on today are fruits or fruiting bodies. 
Many times we find fruits around seeds as another way to protect the inner portion of a seed or the baby plant. Fruits too are often produced once a plant has fully reproduced, gotten the nectar, pollen, and more that it's needed to produce a fruiting body. Fruits help attract pollinators just like flowers do too, either allowing certain organisms to find a piece of fruit, eat it, and spit out the seed, or sometimes accidentally eating the seed and dispersing it farther elsewhere into a different habitat for that plant to grow. This is often why fruits just taste super sweet. Other fruits that we are real familiar with would be that of a peach or potentially that of an apple. And while we might know that certain pollinators like bees are the ones that pollinate apple trees, they don't necessarily eat the apple themselves. We know when apples fall from the tree, there are lots of animals, including deer, squirrels, and more, that'd be happy to take those apples, eat it, and spread those seeds elsewhere. So all the things that we see and some of the ones that we eat are actually key features and adaptations to help a plant fulfill its life cycle, especially in making sure seeds get to where they need to go in order to help those plants survive and grow. And as a bonus for us humans, a lot of these fruits and parts and more are really nutritious and delicious. Mmm, perfect. <laughs> While today we just covered six of the main plant parts, even some of the parts we mentioned have other inner workings or their own anatomy to understand how those parts fully function and help the plant survive and grow. But you may have also noticed that a lot of the parts we saw are actually things that we humans eat. So after discovering plants, these main parts and more that we see, especially if we go outside, I bet you can find some parts of a plant even right in your house. Whether it's food you find in your refrigerator or your kitchen counter or even food you just ate for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. See if you can find up to the six main parts of plants just by looking in your own house. Or maybe there's an object you humans use that came from a certain part of a plant, like wood from the stem or bark of a tree. Or maybe you use something from flowers to help you do a craft and more. The possibilities are endless when it comes to plants. Thank you so much for exploring the basic parts of plant anatomy today. We hope not only that you had a good time, but that you learned something new, too. Make sure that you take time to explore all of the great findings out in nature and beyond when it comes to science. And feel free to share your discoveries, too, especially if they're new. Thanks again, guys. Enjoy your time being a scientist.